Mr. President, you will join me up here on stage. You had a very busy week. You met with President Biden. You spoke before a joint session of Congress, making you only the second Israeli president to have done so, the first, of course, being your father. You were received with a warm welcome. As we noted, it's rare to see bipartisanship in Washington these days, and boy, you got it. I want to read something that you said in your speech. You said, Israel and the United States will inevitably disagree on many matters, but we will always remain family. Our bond may be challenged at times, but it is absolutely unbreakable. Based on your meetings in Washington, are you confident that that feeling is mutual today? Absolutely. And I would uh, want to develop this notion. I know that there are differences in arguments. It's, it's quite clear. And that has happened throughout history on numerous times and events and circumstances. But clearly, there is huge love and affection and affinity between the United States of America and Israel. I could have felt it yesterday out there in the rostrum, looking around this beautiful hall, the incredible seat of the strongest, of the elected members of the strongest empire in the world, all rising up from left and right, from both sides of the aisle, again and again and again, it's not something that you can ignore. It's something that runs deep. It was amazing. It was awesome. It was exciting. It was a very special moment, personally, of course, and for the people of Israel. There are challenges, and there are different views, and there are also streams looking forward. And I mentioned it, the gaps, especially with young generation. It's a challenge that many of you are dealing with also in Israel, but I'm adamant that the relationship is very strong, and I was impressed by meeting the uh, entire current leadership of the United States of America. We'll get to what's happening in Israel in just a moment, but I do have a few more questions about your visit this week. Um, perhaps to alleviate pressure on you, it appears that some form of an invitation for Prime Minister Netanyahu to visit the United States was made. When that will be, where that will be, we still don't know. But the Prime Minister's critics in Israel say the delay has to do with the crisis surrounding judicial reforms. His supporters say it's because of disagreements over Iran. And President Biden, when asked about the lack of a specific date, told CNN recently that this was the most extreme cabinet I've seen in years, and he brought up the issue of settlements and relations with Palestinians. Does the fact that there are at least three, if not more possible reasons floated as to why there is yet to be a date for an invitation worry you about the shared values between the State of Israel and the Biden administration? So there was one a very important sentence which I've said in the speech, that the relationship between the United States of America and Israel is something so deep in terms of its values and its shared interest, it transcends administrations and governments and coalitions. And as such, as you know, uh, I, am, I'm not, I did not come to the United States as anybody's emissary, only as the emissary of my people, of my nation, of the State of Israel, and I was very proud and honored to do so. Regarding the event itself, Regarding the te technicalities of, of uh, Prime Minister's visit to the United States and meeting with President Biden, that was actually discussed in the conversation earlier in the week. And as such, uh, they, they have, they've agreed and they're going to work on the procedure of doing so. I think that the clinging to one, this type of uh, issue here or there does not reflect the enormous depth of the relationship. I mentioned in the Oval Office, we've never had such close, intimate security cooperation ever in the history between our nations. I know, and I don't know everything, but I know a lot. You can trust me. This is really impressive. This is unbelievable. And whatever I said yesterday in Congress, I, I stand behind every word where I've said that we are, it's a two-way partnership. 
on issues such as security, it is. Something you, else, you also did in Congress yesterday was really address the elephant in the room, because while you got roaring standing ovations and praise from both sides of the aisle, there were several members of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party who chose not to attend the session. And you said this, I am not oblivious to criticism among friends, including some expressed by respected members of this House. I respect criticism, especially from friends, although one does not always have to accept it. But criticism of Israel must not cross the line into negation of the state of Israel's right to exist. Questioning the Jewish people's right to self-determination is not legitimate diplomacy, it is anti-Semitism. So my question to you, So my question to you is, do you view some of the comments made by these progressive members and what they've said about Israel specifically as criticism from friends or as a form of anti-Semitism? So I would say that uh, when I grew up in New York in the 1970s, it was clearly a different atmosphere. I remember 1976, okay, the bicentennial of the United States of America. 4th of July, 1976. News come in as to the uh, heroic rescue raid of the Israeli army in Uganda, in Entebbe, rescuing Israeli hostages 4,000 miles away from Israel, 4,000 kilometers, I think. And it was a daring operation. And my father was the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, just like our good friend here, Gilad Erdan. And there was a huge event in the New York port on a U.S. Um, aircraft carrier, the Forrestal, with President Gerald Ford. And the person who attracted most attention in that event, where there were leaders from all over the world and media from all over the world, was the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations because of the rescue raid which riveted the world. And it was, we were very proud to walk in the streets of New York. I understand there are evolutions in societies and opinions. And I've said it. I, if you look around in the Congress yesterday, you could have seen the clear outright majority. But there should always be a dialogue with dissenting voices explaining to them the real truth of Israel. I don't shy away from mistakes or faults or uh, weaknesses uh, that happen in Israel, but can you show me any other nation that doesn't have it? Every other nation, including, <coughs> sorry, the United States of America, has challenges, deep challenges, in the current days, in the way society behaves, in the way society responds to, from, to basic uh, uh, attention span, receipt of information, uh, verifying facts, and then therefore it's very easy to bash Israel on things. It's very easy to portray, and you know it, those of you who know Israel. How people who come back from Israel say, but that's not what we were told. That's not what we were reported at. That's not what we read every day in this important paper or that. And uh, therefore, the truth is somewhere else. Yes, I, we, are, we are the first ones to admit faults and mistakes. And I've said it to my best friends in America in this visit. But at the end of it all, we are first of all a very distinguished and um, very, as you know, I would say, in dignified, truly dignified democracy. We are uh, challenged in ways that very few nations are challenged. We are seeing the empire, empire of evil from Tehran sending its forks all around the country, from north, from Hezbollah, from south, from Gaza, from Iraq, to, uh, and, 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 and uh, through Syria, and so forth and so on. We are seeing terror day in, day out. At the end, we defend ourselves. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes we make mistakes. We don't shy away from social phenomena that we have. 
We know that there are extreme elements in our society, but it happens in many societies and one has to stand firm and explain and show the beauty of our country and the great achievements and the great good that the state of Israel is giving to the world. The enormous amount of fields that we are impacting the well-being of people all over the world. And I outlined a few of them in my speech. So that's why I'm saying it should be a balanced picture. And I'm telling those members of Congress, come learn the facts. I've hosted the dozens and dozens of members of Congress and senators in Israel in the last two years. It's amazing to see how one simply needs to show some of the evidence and the facts to make things clearer and more reasonable. We were criticized about the operation in Jenin. I had a meeting now with the Secretary General of the United Nations. Guys, this is one of the centers of a, um, a you, you can call it, one of the centers of terror and, and, and taking lives of innocent people in Israel. That's where it's all based. We had to go in, we went in. No citizen or uninvolved person was hurt. We had thousand soldiers there. We went in we, and we unraveled a, a whole operation, huge operation of terror and hatred. It's just like uh, the um, NYPD would go into the center of the mob and work there. That's what you need to do. At the end, sometimes you have no choice. You don't usually, you don't want to, but you have to in order to defend your people. And therefore, we should not be misjudged and mistreated with an uh, unbalanced compass looking at the facts. And that's what I'm telling these Congress people. I want to turn to the unprecedented challenges that Israel is facing right now, specifically with regard to the judicial overhaul and the massive backlash that we've seen playing out on the streets for, I believe, 28 consecutive weeks now. At issue today is the reasonableness clause, and for those that aren't aware of it, it is which the Supreme Court currently has authority to invoke to strike down certain decisions made by the government. At issue right now is the government pushing forward legislation to take away that authority from the Supreme Court. It has passed its first reading, and the second and third are expected this week. Prime Minister Netanyahu just tonight in a primetime address said the legislation is going forward, but he's still seeking broad agreement. You yourself tried to mediate this issue and couldn't find a compromise at the time. Do you think that this legislation in its current form is destined to pass this week? So these are critical days in, on this issue. Uh, I can give you a whole legal lecture about the ramifications and the way this discussion has been evolving in Israel for the last 30 years. But it, you know, I, I spoke about it at length to national, in na national speeches and to uh, the Israeli people. I, there were times when I alerted on some of the legislation or when it was originally introduced clearly and then I came forward with an alternative but now it boiled down at this given moment to the issue of reasonableness. I have here a good friend of mine, Steve Coppell, who went with me to school in Ramaz when I studied in Ramaz. He's a big lawyer. <laughs> so Steve, Steve gave me a whole memo about the way uh, Judicial Review looks at these, these um, legal theories where instead of uh, reasonableness, is it capricious, malicious? It's in every state and every country, it's done differently. So it's, in, it's a legal issue that one can speak about. The, qu the question will be how wide the legislation is. And uh, on that, in these given moments, actually right now, there are efforts to try and find solutions, and I hope that leaders will be responsible, open, and attentive to, ability, to the ability of finding amicable solution and wide consensus on this issue. Because I truly believe that the alternative to the Jewish people, to the unity of Israel, uh, is bad, is dangerous. And that is why I keep on repeating my message 
throughout the political system, the people of Israel sit down, try to find a way to resolve this. If one side wins, Israel loses. In meantime, I will just add, Biana, that the issue, the, the debate, and these are very tormenting and painful moments in Israel right now. I'm here, but my heart and soul is with the people of Israel, with the dear citizens of Israel, with those who are worried and those who want to move forward, with those who are worried because at the end, many people in Israel do not know and they don't have a clear picture as to how the process of the legislation, the entire process, the initiatives will end. And that's something that I've also heard in Washington. Meaning, what is the end result? Would it stop only by this, which is one consideration to look at, or is there other chapters ahead? And that is, the, I think, part of the source of a uh, uh, unclear vision of how things will look out at, how they will turn out to be, and this impacts the discourse in Israel as well. You mentioned Washington, so I want to go back to President Biden because he had a busy week as well. He spoke with you, he spoke with the Prime Minister, and apparently he spoke with Thomas Friedman. <laughs> and and on this issue, he had a message that he wanted Friedman to pass along to the Prime Minister, and here's what he said. Please stop now. Don't pass anything this important without a broad consensus, or you are going to break something with Israel's democracy and with your relationship with America's democracy, and it may never be able to get it back. When this government was sworn in six months ago, you told world leaders who were concerned to judge this government by its actions and not its words. We've seen its actions now. So should world leaders, including the President of the United States, be concerned? I was told you're a very friendly interviewer. <laughs> well, anyway, I, li I lack frank and honest questions, but there are certain questions that you don't expect the President of the state, who's above the political realm, to answer in detail. And I think of course, that there are, you know, at the end, the, this is a political debate between one school of thought and, and the other, one coalition and the other, and, and therefore, this is simply another tribute to Israel's democracy that there is such a heated debate, that there is a variety of opinions, and I hope the people of Israel, and, uh, and they, they will express their views at whatever time and form and manner uh, will require them to put uh, it in the ballot boxes. And I don't think that I should answer this question in depth. Okay. I think it's only fair that I asked, Pardon? but I appreciate your answer. Yeah, yeah, it's fair of you to ask, absolutely. From a national security perspective, we already know that 160 Air Force Reservists, if not more, have threatened not to show up if this legislation passes next week. Are you concerned that that creates an opportunity for Israel's enemies to sense weakness? And does that lead to a national security threat? So first of all, I keep on saying, I said it from my first speech on 12th February, that I know, this I truly know, that our enemies are interpreting the situation in Israel and the arguments uh, that emanated with the United States of America as a sign of weakness. And they may, they may try to miscalculate the situation. So my answer is two, has two uh, facets to it. One is the relationship with the United States as was shown this week, clearly as was shown, and by, expressed by the clear words of President Biden on his commitment to Israel's security in the ironclad alliance on security uh, should not be mistaken, our enemies should not be mistaken. It's as strong as ever, and I confirm it. And secondly, I think our enemies sometimes miscalculate the Israeli aggressive, open, vibrant, um, uh, extremely vociferous debate 
wrong here. They, they don't understand what democracy is all about. They don't. With all due respect, what does a person do when he doesn't like something in a democracy? He protests. She protests. I think the fact that there are so many protesters throughout the country is a tribute to Israel's democracy. And we should respect it. And, and, it, and as such, our enemies should not miscalculate the fact that if, God forbid, there is anything, the people of Israel unite immediately. And I hope that the issue of um, not serving, not, not going on reserve duty, I really, truly, I said it on numerous occasions, should be out of the political debate. I know I'm a bit perhaps naive at this stage, but I sincerely hope it will fade away. So I have two more questions before I open it up to, we have a few questions that were submitted by audience members. Okay, sure. I want to turn to Ukraine, because President Zelensky has made his frustration with the State of Israel very clear in terms of what he views as the lack of support, material support in this war. He has repeatedly asked for help with air defense, specifically Iron Dome, to no avail. Now I know Israel has offered substantial humanitarian aid, but in comparison to other Western allies, Israel has not delivered what its allies have. Why not? And do you worry that this will put Israel on the wrong side of history? So there's a kind of a naive uh, viewpoint on looking at this situation, and sometimes it's an oversimplified uh, discussion. So let's put the record straight. Next month, please God, an early detection uh, alert system will be deployed in Kiev, founded and established by Israel for all citizens of Kiev, then for all citizens of Ukraine. It's an early detection warning system. It will be like every Israeli has, and it will tell them where and when they may be attacked at a given moment. And this is vital for their well-being and their protection. I'm saying this not in order kind of to wash away the claims, but I'm just giving the picture as a whole. There is a lot of discussion between us and the authorities in Ukraine. Mrs. Zelensky, the wife of the president, just was a guest of my wife, First Lady Michal. Just a few weeks ago, I met her myself. It was an incredible visit, and it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's a serious visit. The Jewish federations of North America and the federation here were all involved in working together for the last year, including uh, with, the, with Israeli NGOs who are leading in the world on post-trauma, dealing with emergency situations and medical services for the entire home front of Ukraine. And Michal led this initiative for the last year and it became a huge success. So before people complain, <clears throat> I will add that Hebrew is the most highly spoken language in Ukraine by volunteers from Israel all throughout this period that we realize clearly that the in involvement of Iran in, that, in this war, uh, the fact that Iranian drones are killing innocent civilians in Ukraine is another reason to tell the world what Iran is all about. I may also remind everybody that we have Russian presence uh, in uh, Syria not far away from us that we have about a million Jews in Russia. So we have made it clear that we have a certain policy on lethal weapons where we are very cautious that state secrets and lethal weapons, uh, state secrets will not fall in the hands of enemies and lethal weapons therefore will not be used. But on so many other issues, we are doing good. And of course, in the international community, and Ambassador Erdan will confirm we are ironclad supporting the uh, uh, Ukrainian demand, especially for uh, uh, territorial sovereignty and all other resolutions. 
My final question is on the issue, the important issue of anti-Semitism, but just to put a button on Ukraine, I, I believe the last time you were there was in 2021. And just last week, President Zelensky criticized Prime Minister Netanyahu and his two predecessors for not accepting an invitation to travel to Ukraine now. If you were offered an invitation, would you travel to Ukraine? So actually, it's an issue that was never brought to bear with me, and, and we have an intense dialogue with uh, Ukrainian representatives on many issues. Uh, I also spoke with uh, President Zelensky a few months ago. He was my first host as President of Israel. We then uh, marked the inauguration of the Babi Yar Center in Babi Yar. Uh, our heart goes to uh, the, the people of Ukraine for their pain. We're not indifferent. We're doing a lot of things. And if the opportunity arises, we'll review it, naturally. So now to what I presume everyone views as one of the most important and frightening issues, and that is the rise in anti-Semitism. Reports of anti-Jewish incidents are at an all-time high since the Anti-Defamation League has been keeping track. They're with here. almost 3,700, yes, our friend Jonathan's been very busy for all the wrong reasons. Almost 3,700 reported incidents across the United States in 2022. Roughly 40% of American Jews say that they have changed their behavior in some way because they're afraid of anti-Semitism. It doesn't help when some of this anti-Semitism comes from high-profile individuals, most recently a presidential candidate. RFK Jr. last week was on video saying that Ashkenazi Jews and Asians were somehow ethnically immune from COVID. Aside from idiotic, how... <laughs> did you react when you heard that and when you see these types of numbers? So anti-Semitism anti is a, a major challenge that we've been dealing with in the entire vista of Jewish leadership. In dealing with. I was impressed, truly impressed, to hear the leadership of the houses, both houses yesterday when I met them, how staunch and strong they are on combating anti-Semitism in America. They're very much on alert. I had an incredible discussion with your Vice President, Kamala Harris, and she and her husband, the first, second gentleman, were uh, very proactive. And then, to, and then President Biden came forward and approved the first ever national strategy to combat anti-Semitism, a presidential. I recommend, I recommend to read that document. The special emissary, special envoy of President Biden, Professor Deborah Lipstadt, <laughs> is clearly one of the greatest scholars on earth, one of the greatest scholars on earth on this topic. Her books, her fights, her fights against David Irving, then the Holocaust denier, have, have brought her up to this seat. And now this paper, I read it from, top, from cover to cover, is amazing. Now we have to implement it. Well, now we have to see the administration, of course, follow up and implement this strategy. And I know ADL and other organizations will definitely follow suit in conversing and having a, inter, a very close contact and interface with the administration because this is vital. We see it on campuses, we see it in synagogues, in communities, we see it all over. I don't have to repeat what you've said. It's all over the world. And it always, you know, we always say, it always starts with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews. So therefore, we should support this strategy and make sure that it is implemented constantly, forever, not altered or changed by anybody, because it, it encompasses the, all the age groups, all the various uh, facets all that from there it emanates, such as social networks, such as brainwashing, such as terrible rhetoric, which you've just mentioned, horrific and terrible rhetoric. So I think we're all united in in this battle, which is one of the key battles of the era. I'm going to thank you for that.
I'm going to turn it now in the remaining minutes we have to a few of the audience questions which were submitted, so I'm just going to read them. The first is, how do you think your background and your friendship in the religious sector feeds into your ability to navigate the growing divide between the religious and secular communities? So, it was mentioned by Israel Nitzan, the acting consul general, correctly, that in this room we've convened one of 18 labs under my initiative, the voice of the people, Kola Am, to discuss the um, challenges that are facing world jury all over the world, 18 labs all over the world. It's only the beginning of my entire initiative, which is to form a platform of dialogue. We have great organizations, as you know, I was the chair of the executive of the Jewish Agency for Israel, and as such, that's a very good organization. And I've partnered with the Jewish Agency in WZO as to implementing my vision here, but the idea is also to identify the future leadership of the Jewish people. The Jewish people are ever-changing, ever-evolving. There are so many new developments, and I truly believe, for example, if you look at, uh, at current politics in New York, so it, it, it's also a mirror image of the current politics in Israel. There is a growing ultra-Orthodox Haredi community. One has to have them in the room as well for dialogues. In the past, they were less present. Now they need to be more present. And there should be a real dialogue between all streams of Judaism, something which I truly respect and believe. There are friends here who I love. I've been discussing them, it with them all my life. And I was very honored and proud that all the leaders of the streams of Judaism were present in my speech yesterday. It's a picture which I want to, do, to send to the entire world to show what love of Israel is all about. Although so much has changed, what learning from your father do you apply to how you yourself fulfill the office of president of the State of Israel? You have big shoes to fill. Let's make it the last question. <laughs> okay. Meaning, let's go others and then get to it, because that's like more personal. You want me to come back to that? Yeah, okay. exactly. In your current role as president of the State of Israel, any specific goals you would hope to achieve? You've got five more years, I think, right? Let's first understand, it's the role of the President of Israel is a, is a European model or other nations that have a model of a head of state who is not an executive uh, and has no real executive rights. And However, the presidency in Israel has huge moral clout and, and uh, soft power and I am treading in the footsteps of many great Israeli leaders who are president of Israel and understanding the importance of the moment. Right now, the importance of the moment is to keep the nation of Israel unified amidst its tormenting internal strife and debate on the judicial reform, but it's much larger. It's an issue that has to do with how we move forward and, of course, protect and preserve the, democra uh, the democratic values of the State of Israel. But more than that, I want to speak to the entire uh, uh, world of uh, Jewish communities around the world, I, and, and I put that as a major challenge of mine and a major topic on my agenda. And, of course, there is present the, the voice of Israel, the name of Israel in the international arena, focus on the main challenges of Israel internally, together with my wife, Michal. We focus on many, many issues, many issues, the Arab community and its challenges, the uh, Ethiopian Olim and, uh, community and, the, and its challenges, the diversity of Israeli society, which is fantastic. And there are many partners here who work with us on this. And so many other issues of an evolving, fascinating, wonderful, wonderful, incredible people that we have. Well, you will be a spry 67, very young, a lot of future left ahead of oh, you. There's rumors about again. what you may do after your role as president and go back into politics. So if there's anything you want to announce, feel free. But <laughs> in the meantime, I do want to close by talking about the big shoes that you filled. And of course, okay, that is your but father. I'll just say about your comment, Michal says, if you want to go to politics, that's only with your next wife. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, enough said. Should I ask you the question again about your father? Yeah, so I'm very proud with my family lineage. It was always part of my DNA. I will remind to this distinguished audience, my family stems in so many circles of life that impacted the world in the last hundred years. I had an illustrious uncle who was a legend here and in Israel. His name was Abba Iban. He was a legend. Was, was Israel's voice in the 50s and 60s when he was a star in America, the first Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, was ambassador in Washington and foreign minister. I had another uncle who was a huge diplomat, Rabbi Jacob Herzog, who was a, a, the director general of the prime minister's office. So you can imagine with my father being a very famous Israeli major general in the army, and my grandfather being the chief rabbi of Israel, what, what happens on Friday night dinners for a young boy? We hardly spoke at the New York Nets or Knicks or anything like that, <laughs> believe me. And therefore, I am very proud to follow this, these footsteps and, uh, and learn a lot from my my uh, uh, forebearers, the women in my family were, were giants as well, believe me. My grandmother, my mother, my mother was the first environment, environmentalist, the first green fighter in the state of Israel. I had, I had two great aunts who were incredible ladies. So, we are a serving family. I'm very proud that my brother Mike is the Israeli ambassador to the United States. And therefore, I am honored to continue this legacy. But I will say, of course, that as we say, in each generation you have, it has its own challenges. And therefore, I take my decisions and my actions only through my own personal moral compass, my own conscience, and the way I interpret best how to serve the state of Israel, its people, the Jewish people, and our nation. Well, Mr. President, you have much to be proud of with your family and your legacy, and I just want to close by saying, as a proud American Jew, who came to this country as a political refugee from the former Soviet Union thanks to an Israeli visa. I will forever be indebted. And as a journalist... I will just... And as a journalist, yeah. as a journalist, pursuing democracy in a better country is something that unites both of our countries, as I know many of the journalists at home who may annoy you, but they have the same right to do the same. So it's an honor, and thank you so and much. And just before we finish, you know, the greatness of the Jewish people is that we care for even the single individual. The fact that Hadar Golden's mother, Leah, is here with us today is a huge issue. <laughs> Let me just remind everybody, for nine years, Hadar has been uh, abducted and is, and is in Gaza. Also his colleague, Oran Shaul, they both fought for the state of Israel in battle uh, in protective edge. Two other Israelis, a Muslim, Hisham al Said, and, an, and a, an Israeli of Ethiopian origin, Abera Mengistu, are also in Gaza. We are doing whatever we can to bring them back home. I think we should all be united in supporting Leah, who's here, her, her and all her colleagues in the pursuit of freedom. We are thinking of you as well as the family of Elizabeth Surkov as well. Yes, so. absolutely. Elizabeth Surkov, who's now in Iraq and has been abducted there too. You're right. Thank you very much for Thank this honor. Thank you so honor. much. Thank you, everyone.